is now 1.30 and we will start the recording of the session. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Preventive Medicine Grand Rounds for the 5th of April 2023. I am Gary Brunette from the Division of Workforce Development. The Preventive Medicine Grand Rounds is sponsored by the CDC Preventive Medicine Residency and Fellowship and the Health Resources Services Administration Bureau of Health Workforce. We use Zoom for the audio and presentation and the question box to pose questions. Note you can pose questions via the question box at any point during the lecture and the speaker will work on answering them at his discretion. Note your name may appear associated with the question you posed. If you do not want your name to be associated with the question, then please check the submit anonymously box. Um, continuing education credits are available for the live course up to one month after the presentation date and for the recorded version up to two years from the date of the presentation. And this is through the CDC Training and Continuing Education online portal. The course code for this grand rounds is all capital letters and they are CDC PMRF. Please see the chat box for more information. And if you have any questions, please contact the program at prevmed at cdc.gov. Please remember that the views presented by the speaker are theirs alone and do not represent CDC, the Department of Health and Human Services, TSA, or the US government. Today's grand rounds will be titled Occupational Medicine and Public Health and are pre presented by Fabrice Zarnecki from the TSA, the Transportation Security Agency. The presentation will be approximately one hour with 30 minutes for questions and answers afterwards. So with that, uh, I would like to welcome our presenter and I will hand over at this point to Fabrice. Hey, thanks, Dr. Burnett, and uh, good afternoon. If you're on the East Coast, we'll talk about occupational medicine and public health. Um, you heard the disclaimer, but I have to tell you that uh, what you're hearing today, that's my opinions only and not, not my employer and not the, uh, not the US government. Now I'm going to try to make this session interactive. I'm going to ask you questions. If you could answer that live um, as much as possible, certainly for the longer questions, uh, I might take that at the end. So uh, if you could put something in the Q&A, in your opinion, what is occupational medicine? Not, so not seeing anything. Um, oh, work wellness, job-related injuries. That's what we do, the health of workers. Yeah, this is all good. Um, my definition, and that's my own, but I found out that other people use the same. It's the impact of the job on the health and the impact of the health on the job. So it goes both ways. So care of employees, safe environment, medicine tailor, tailor to workers. And this is all, uh, this is all true. Um, as a general categorization, think of what the job does to your health. So think um, work injury, work illnesses, but also workplace violence. And what the, the health of the workers does to the job, think fitness for duty. Um, Now, um, here are five pictures. What do you see here? Understanding that this is about occupational medicine. You know, you see a military firefighter, you see a police car, 
you see a, an offshore platform, um, an office, um, I guess a, a early 20th century office and a, a manufacturing. Hazards, work environments, quality and safety. So let me tell you what I see. I see workplaces. Well, that's where I work. This is what occupational medicine uh, uh, is focused on different potential work hazards, a variety of differential, different occupational exposures, so all true. But first, this is work. This is where um, people work. And certainly my job, our job is to then identify and, uh, and mitigate hazard. So that's the structure of my talk. Um, I'll start with history because I think it's a good way to approach the specialty. Uh, we'll go over the scope. And then uh, I will use three examples where I'll go a little bit more in depth. And I chose these examples just because that's where that's what I do the most. Um, also go over occupational history because that's something that's often forgotten. Now, please understand that we have an hour and we could be talking about occupational medicine for days. So this is not meant to be a comprehensive talk and you are going to see a, a sample of uh, of what uh, occupational medicine covers. So let's talk about the, the history. Um, traditionally, the first mention of occupational medicine, at least in writing, is, uh, is uh, Hippocrates. And um, he made a determination of a link between mining and uh, lead poisoning. But uh, what's interesting is since the beginning, occupational medicine did cover epidemiology. Well, that was what Hippocrates did. That was a, an observation based on, on a population of workers. Pliny the Elder, um, that was similar, was also mining. I believe it was also late poisoning, but he went one step beyond. Uh, that was the first uh, known recommendation of respiratory protection to protect the workers. Then Ramazzini, um, you see his book in 1700, uh, generally uh, uh, seen as the first textbook of, um, of occupational medicine. He proposed to add a question to the standard medical history taking that uh, Hippocrates had uh, put together to add the question on what is your occupation. And, um, and we'll go back on that. Some of the hazards that he described were dust, chemicals, metal, Repetitive motion, I think in 1700, uh, he talked about ergonomics, he talked about the danger of prolonged setting, back pain linked to work, and recommended exercise, physical exercise to both prevent and treat back pain. But what's interesting is his book, called The uh, Disease of Workers um, in Latin, was meant to be read by policymakers, not by healthcare professionals, but by policymakers. And you will see that's a, that's a recurrent theme in occupational medicine is we're trying to fix the problem. Um, then POT in, uh, in Britain, that was the first reported occupational cancer. So chimney weeds, typically uh, young uh, children, uh, vulnerable, a lot of orphans. And he found out that the mortality of squamous scale carcinoma of the scrotum was 200 times higher uh, compared with the, uh, the general population. He made recommendations on um, both elimination. So some country decided that to sweep chimneys, they would go from the top rather than go from the bottom. So you didn't have to have somebody inside the chimney. Uh, he made recommendation on personal protective equipment, so clothing, mostly hygiene, um, um, get clean after doing that type of work. And again, some countries uh, adopted that uh, with, with pretty good results. The, the policy changes in Britain that to show how uh, you know, difficult these things are. Um, so after his publication, there was a a law in Britain to change the minimal age to do that type of work to eight. So kids younger than eight after the work of uh, Percival Pat could now do chimney sweeps. Eventually that was increased to age 10, 16 and, and eventually um, banned completely. Alice Hamilton, 
uh, was the first uh, appointed faculty at, uh, at Harvard University. Um, did most of her work on lead. Uh, she made recommendations against using lead in, in gasoline. She worked on other toxins. I want to give you an example of something she did uh, during World War I. She was asked by the army to look at uh, TNT, so an explosive uh, manufacturing process, because TNT was causing very severe, even deadly anemia uh, in workers. And she found out that it was through skin absorption. She made again recommendations on uh, both personal protective equipment and hygiene. Um, so she did the epidemiology, she did a clinical piece, but she also uh, uh, did the uh, the preventive medicine part, and and she did get involved like uh, like uh, Pat and um, and Rabazzini. She did get involved in in policy changes um, as well. Now let's talk about the scope of occupational medicine, and um, the document I'm using here. It's a list of competencies put together by the American College of Occupational and Environmental Medicines, OEM, Occupational and Environmental Medicine. Typically, the specialties go together. I'm going to emphasize occupational medicine here. And so let's go over some of the examples here. So let's talk about clinical first. Uh, work injury case. This is probably the, the high visibility part of occupational medicine. This is taking care of mostly workers' comp, so workplace injuries also. Um, occupational illnesses that can be uh, performed at a freestanding facility. That's probably the most common, but also employers can offer that on site, uh, or it could be uh, hospital-based. And like I said, most hospitals have a have an employee health uh, service, and uh, quite often they they open that to to other employee employers and employees. Pre-placement examination. That's the, um, that's the official term of the medical exam you get before you start working, at least in the US, um, under the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, you can only do these exams after a tentative job offer has been extended. That's why it's called uh, pre-placement. Surveillance exam that could be job related or exposure related. So think of uh, being exposed to noise. Um, lead, uh, other specific toxins, but also you have to wear a respirator because of the job. Uh, wearing a respirator may require uh, periodic exams. Uh, also because of the job, let's say you are a truck driver or a pilot, the authority, the uh, Federal Aviation Administration and in the US, the uh, for truck drivers, the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration requires uh, periodic exams. Um, to continue uh, flying a plane or, or driving a truck. We'll spend a lot more time on fitness for duty evaluations. I'll skip that right now. An impairment rating, that's a percentage. It's a number, a, a portion of 100 um, that allows compensation. So typically in a state or a federal workers' comp system and each jurisdiction, decides what type of, uh, of guide uh, to use. Typically in the US, we use um, American Medical Association guides of different editions. And then the, the examining physician, which is often, but not always an occupational medicine physician, uh, then gives a, a, a permanent impairment uh, rating. The, uh, the drug testing review, that's uh, something performed by an MRO, that's a medical review officer. Uh, that is the interpretation of a drug test result. So as you know, a lot of uh, uh, employers um, are doing drug testing. They sometimes are required. We'll go back to the uh, transportation industry. Pilots and uh, truck drivers are required to, to get um, uh, drug testing at a specific frequency. So now let's say you are a pilot or you are um, a truck driver and you are treated for ADHD, you take amphetamines with a legitimate prescription, um, you get a drug test and the drug test finds amphetamines, uh, you shouldn't get fired for that. You, know, you have a legitimate prescription, but there is a process uh, where a physician gets involved, verifies the prescription, verifies that there is a legitimate explanation for the uh, for the drug test, 
and um, and then extend a, a determination that um, you know once once there is a legitimate explanation, it is it is a negative um, drug test, with a caveat that there could be a safety concern, which sends us back to the fitness for duty evaluation. So think of the uh, truck driver who is taking, let's say, opioids. Um, that could trigger a fitness for duty evaluation on whether that uh, um, you know you, you want that truck driver to drive like while taking opioids, but it is not a uh, an illegal uh, drug use. And on the next um, competency laws and regulation. Well, let me go over all, all the the acronyms. OSHA is the uh, Occupational Safety and Health Administration, that's part of the Department of Labor, and they issue standards. So in general, employers must comply with these standards. Um, understand they are, uh, um, they are exceptions, and we'll go over some of these standards, but I mentioned the respiratory protection, I mentioned the, the, the lead and the, and the hearing standards. Uh, FMCSA, that's the uh, part of the DOT, the Department of Transportation, dealing with truck drivers, uh, Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration, and they have, uh, um, they have enforceable standards and also recommendations, good practice recommendations on the clearance, the medical clearance of uh, truck drivers. HIPAA, that's the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, there, there are privacy rules within, uh, within HIPAA, and in, in occupational medicine, we have to have a, um, there's a balancing act between the, the privacy of the workers and what we have, what we may tell or we have to tell the, uh, the employer. And uh, in, in general, HIPAA does not cover uh, workers' compensation, but during a workers' compensation exam, I might find that um, a worker has a medical condition that's totally unrelated, and I have to, uh, to keep that private um, in general. Uh, consensus standards, the, uh, the example giving in that competency rule is specifically the National Fire Protection Association uh, standard called 1582. That's the medical standard for firefighters. Now, it is a consensus standard. It is a voluntary standard, but it also comes with a, I would say, a fairly significant amount of liability if a fire department does not use that standard, uh, or if you are a, a healthcare professional evaluating a firefighter's fitness for duty, you're not using that standard. And um, the, uh, the NIOSH um, firefighter fatality investigation quite often uh, refers to, um, to recommending, uh, and, I'm, and I'm reading, uh, implement a comprehensive pre-placement and annual medical evaluation consistent with that NFPA 1582. NIOSH makes that recommendation quite often when they investigate a cardiac death of a firefighter. So understand the liability if you don't. If you are a fire department or you are a, um, a chief, you're a fire chief and you are, your agency is not using that, uh, that standard or at least a similar standard. GINA, that's the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, which generally bans the use of genetic information in employment determination. But what is genetic information for clinical medicine? That's called family history. So in general, we cannot use family history to make uh, employment decisions, fitness for duty decision. American with Disabilities Act, um, already mentioned that. Uh, you, you will see come again during um, the fitness for duty process. Uh, I mean, creates a lot of safeguards for the uh, employees. And uh, finally, FMLA, that's the Family and Medical Leave Act, uh, which grants 480 hours of unpaid leave per year to uh, workers who, who meet specific categories, but the medical piece is something called a serious health condition. And the, seri the definition of serious health condition is, is legal. It's not a, a medical definition. 
And that is where the, um, the uh, occupational medicine provider or non-occupational medicine providers who deal with SMLA, they have to understand that um, a, a fairly benign um, medical condition. So let's say a, um, an uncomplicated sprained ankle that requires multiple visits. I say one visit at the time of injury, one or two follow-up visits, that will probably meet the FMLA criteria of serious health condition. And I tell you, so as a um, former emergency physician, that's not what I would call um, a serious health condition, at least if it is um, uncomplicated. So you definitely need to know the regulations pretty well. Uh, work fitness uh, and disability management, that might be one of the most interesting parts of uh, at least my job is the work restrictions. Um, and we'll go back to that with the, the fitness for duty part, but if I see an employee or even an applicant with medical issues that could interfere with the job, I, the, the, the outcome of that process is me telling the employer, here are the task that the employee should or could not do. And there, and there is a slight difference. You know, are they unable to do it or they should not do because they would create a safety hazard. Um, and that's a medical opinion. So that should be communicated as is to the employer. The accommodation is a little bit different. This is a recommendation. This is up to the employer to make the decision. And the accommodation is a work modification uh, that allows the employee to do the essential job function. And we'll go back to that, uh, uh, to that concept. We have to tell the employer whether that is a permanent or a temporary accommodation, but then it is up to the employer to decide. You know, first, are they obligated to accommodate the employee? And in general, they are obligated to at least consider the accommodation, um, but we physicians could advise the employer that is not our area and it's certainly not our area to, to decide. Return to work and stay at work. For most employees, it is better for their health to stay at work or to return to work early. So we have to be creative uh, we have to create job modification that allow these employees to stay. That requires medical people that both know the medical and understand the medical conditions, but also know the job. So we need to know the occupation and we need to know the, um, the workplace. A um, little bit of data, a uh, study from Finland in 1980, the uh, total mortality, the relative risk with unemployment is 1.93. And with unemployment, uh, there is increased mortality from suicide, coronary artery disease, and cancer. So this is not just the uh, injury putting the person at work. This is the consequences of uh, not working. So as much as possible, we need to try to, to bring employees um, but back to work. Um, and that is, that is one of the, uh, of the unique aspects of, uh, of occupational medicine, knowing both the medicine, the, the, the disease or the injury, but also knowing the, uh, the workplace. Hazard recognition, um, personal protective equipment, we all know that. And I will slide on that a little bit later. The walkthrough assessment, that's what allows us to know the job. So we can't just rely on description from the employees or the employers or written job description. Uh, we need to get out and we might be the only uh, um, medical specialty that gets to do that. Um, I mean, on the, on the fire sum, the uh, American College of Occupational and Environmental Medicine brings physicians to a fire academy almost every year and we suit them up in the uh, bunker gear, give them uh, the uh, self-breathing, uh, self-contained breathing apparatus if we have the, the, that option and get them to actually uh, carry the hose and uh, extinguish a fire. And you, you have a, 
a, a much better appreciation of the the difficulty of the of the job. A hearing conservation program that in the U.S. that's a that's a NOSHA standard that uh, defines that, and that's a it's a very comprehensive program that covers periodic hearing tests, training the workers with the goal of avoiding hearing loss, providing hearing protection equipment, monitoring the noise, but also share that information with the employees and finally record keeping and um, some level of transparency, the, the employees have access to their, uh, to their records. So what you see here uh, through everything I told you, you know, beyond that uh, maybe treating one person at a time, the, the key piece here, I think, is, uh, is communication. And that's probably the, the, the most challenging. How do we, how do we convince the, um, both employees and employers to do, the, um, to do the right thing? And luckily, in general, people do, do listen to, uh, to medical. Um, health screenings, uh, there is a formal piece. You have health risk assessment. You have biometrics that can be done at the workplace, such as blood pressure, body mass index. You can even do uh, um, cholesterol and glucose based on a, on a finger stick. But also, uh, you know, I do the walkthrough assessment. Now I can do an informal health screening because I have direct access to the workforce, and hopefully, I'm gaining their trust. And here is the time where I could be asking about smoking, nutrition, and, and exercise and do that informal screening that then leads to, uh, to coaching. Um, so they do the, the right thing. Uh, immunizations, we do recommend immunizations that are specific to both the job and the exposure. So think hepatitis B for first responders, for uh, um, healthcare professionals. Um, how about an outbreak? And the one that's challenging for me is let's say you have a workplace where you have multiple employers. So think transportation hubs. And let's say you have multiple transportation companies and you have the, um, the company managing the hub. The one employer, one company one might see an outbreak um, so let's say COVID-19, but they don't necessarily know what's going on with the other employers. And only public health can, uh, can tie that together. Uh, so occupational medicine should reach out to public health things. Here is what I see. Um, is there something beyond my company, but at the same workplace? But on the flip side, public health can reach out to occupational medicine for help. Uh, it is very easy for an employer to isolate and quarantine employees. We have the resources to do that and we can do that fairly quickly. We can also communicate to, uh, to the workforce very, very quickly and, uh, and very, very easily. So if you're in public health and you need to reach out to a population that is uh, employment based, you know, by all means, um, think of, yes, you can reach out to the employer, to the company, but if you reach out to their occupational medicine people, you will probably uh, get a better understanding of what needs to be done and also the sense of urgency. So that could be a, a, an additional resource. Management and administration, uh, you'll see everything supporting the practice. The one I want to uh, point your attention to is marketing. Uh, it's very, certainly very unusual for, uh, for healthcare professionals to do, to do marketing, but in, in occupational medicine, this is actually pretty common. Um, I mean, not for me as a, as a government employee, but I, I have done that before in my, in my previous occupational medicine jobs. Okay, so we're done with the, the competencies. Now let's go over my, my three topics. That's the, the shortest, the hierarchy of controls. This is something that the, uh, the National Safety Foundation um, put together uh, starting in 1950. And you see here the, uh, 
the uh, picture from uh, from NIOSH, uh, National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, a branch of uh, of CDC. So let's go over examples, and then I'm going to ask you my uh, my second question. Um, um, so think about uh, um, think about COVID nineteen here. Uh, so elimination, if the hazard is a fall, imagine you're putting all the work at ground level. Obviously at ground level, you're not going to, you're not going to fall. Substitution, you can go from paints that have solvents to paints that are water-based or you're getting rid of the solvents. You're not getting rid of the paint, but you, you're replacing the solvent um, hazard. Engineering controls, that could be guards physical guard guardrails around moving parts. Administrative con controls, that's policies, but also think of warning signs. Policies could be, we're limiting the amount of time workers spend in a very specific environment. And then the least effective, but the one that's probably the most often quoted, especially now um, with COVID-19 in our memories, personal protective equipment. So uh, let me ask you to put on the, uh, on the uh, um, Q&A box, what do you see as being controls for COVID-19? Why is elimination would look like substitution, engineering control, and uh, administrative control? PPE, that's, that's, the, uh, that's the easy part. Okay. So first one, elimination, stay at home. Yes, um, quarantine and isolation, yes. And that might um, uh, cover administ administrative controls as well. Lockdown for elimination, yes. Uh, elimination, vaccination and treatment, I would say maybe. Physical distancing, uh, administrative control. Uh, so I think you got that. So vaccination, anything, elimination, anything that prevents infection from going to the workplace. I'll give you my list, not meant to be comprehensive. Uh, so elimination, that's isolation, isolating um, um, people who carry the, the disease who are contagious. Substitution, I don't think that was mentioned. Telework, so remote work. Engineering control, airflow and filtration. Physical barriers. So plexiglass here is what was mentioned as administrative control. So, some of it could be um, could be semantics, whether it's engineering or administrative. You know, assuming it's effective, and certainly distancing uh, could cover both engineering and administrative controls. Uh, indoor air quality for engineering, yes. Uh, my list of administrative control is uh, encouraging compliance. So think of creating um, policies, promoting even financial incentives uh, to encourage compliance with vaccination, quarantine, isolation, va masking and distancing, uh, screening. So screening symptomatic people, making sure that symptomatic people do not get to the workplace, limiting density at the workplace through scheduling, uh, periodic cleaning and, and signage, and obviously personal protective equipment. Um, administrative policy to stay at home for five days to two weeks after a fever, yes. And especially if you provide leave to do that. And yeah, I think we got everything here. I said I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, personal protection, personal protective equipment. And you see pictures on the top right, you have a face shield that is PPE, then you have a surgical mask, then an N95 at the, on the bottom right at the center, you have a half face air purifying respirator. Um, on the completely bottom left, we're back to our military firefighter with an SCBA, a self-contained breathing apparatus uh, where you bring your own air. And on its immediate right, you have a, a PAPR that's a powered air purifying respirator where you have a, a positive pressure, um, more comfortable and uh, especially in a, you know, in a warm environment than the uh, APR. Um, now, uh, 
want to mention that both surgical mask and N95, uh, they don't work just through physical filtration. They also have electrostatic properties. Um, so you have to, was certainly an issue with N95. You need to make sure that you're dealing with a, something that's uh, that's correctly built and not a and not a and not a counterfeit. Um, just go over one question here: Should PPE correlate with the type of job you do rather than it being the least effective? Yes, yes. Uh, that's just the way uh, uh, the um, National Safety Foundation and and now and I are adopted as being the uh, uh, the least effective. I, I don't necessarily want to spend too much time on that, uh, but the, the, some of the problems with PPE, they, they don't work perfectly. You know, they, don't, uh, they don't get rid of 100% of the hazard. And it's fairly easy for um, people not to use them or not to use them properly or for or not, to, not to use the right equipment. But yes, PPE should, actually PPE should correlate to the exposure even more than the, uh, the actual job. So if you do, if you are a firefighter and you do a fire suppression over overhaul, you need to wear an SCBA. There's no, no question about that. Okay, then this is the first of my two more in-depth topic is a causation analysis. And I'll show you how, how that's, that's done at least through, through one model. Um, first, you look at the medical literature. So that is the, that is the epidemiology and in general, that is the most common uh, set of um, you know, textbooks, epidemiology textbook, typically call them criteria. And that's the criteria that uh, are attributed to um, Sir Austin Bradford Hill, a, a British uh, epidemiologist and statistician. But what's interesting is Dr. Hill never called them criteria. And you see he scored, he called them aspects. So this is, this is more of a guide for uh, for you to analyze the epidemiological literature and then reach an opinion on whether there is association according to the epidemiological uh, literature. So I'm going to go over three of these aspects, go over the rest a little bit faster. But so the first one deemed to be the most important by, uh, by Dr. Hill was the strength of the association. And I'm going back to uh, Percival Pat and the chimney sweeps, the mortality was 200 times higher. I mean, how often do you see that in modern occupational medicine studies? Very, very rarely. Uh, the other examples Dr. Hill gave in his 1965 article was the, um, the lung cancer mortality in smokers or factor of uh, times uh, nine or 10, again, pretty high. Uh, heart attacks, heart attack mortality in smokers twice as high as the general population and cholera mortality with, uh, um, with the, the, the water um, um, uh, sources that were grossly polluted times 14 compared to the, the water that appeared uh, cleaner. And uh, that's the snow who broke the, the handle of the, um, of the water pump. So unfortunately, you will rarely see some of these numbers, but I'll, I'll give you so, a few uh, modern examples. Uh, then the one that I personally think is probably the, the second most important is the consistency. So you look at all your studies. Again, I'm giving you here the example that uh, uh, Dr. Hill put there. Uh, 36 studies found that smoking was associated with lung cancer. Okay, that's, that's pretty good. Now, if you have um, 10 studies showing association and 10 studies showing no association, then you don't have consistency and that's much more difficult to, to reach a conclusion uh, based on that. And the, uh, the last very powerful argument is the, uh, what he called the biological gradient. So the more exposure you get, do you get more of the bad outcomes? You smoke more, do you get more cancer? That unfortunately is, is rarely found in uh, occupational studies, we do use surrogate. So think of a firefighter, how many years you've been working as a firefighter, but also how many um, fires you responded to. 
versus just um, you know you're doing let's say medical calls assuming that's the the fire that's causing the 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 cancer and that's information we sometimes have we have studies looking at that but these are not um, by far the the most common studies you see the strengths of association all the time when you put the studies together you get the consistency but um, I, I certainly, as a, as a user, I would like to see that those response uh, uh, more often. The, the other um, aspects, you know, not to call them criteria, uh, specificity that do you see increase in cancers in general, or do you see increase in, let's say, a specific cancer, let's say lung cancer. Um, temporality in the study, did the exposure precede the, um, uh, the disease? So that's, that's pretty much a given uh, in studies. Now, plausibility, is that is a make sense? Does it make sense from a biological perspective? And uh, unfortunately, the limitation of that criterion, as um, Hill stated it, it depends on the biological knowledge at that specific time. Coherence is, does it make sense based on the generally known facts? Dr. Hill put. So it's, it is similar to coherence, but it goes beyond biology. And um, our experiment, is there experimental evidence? We rarely have the uh, uh, experimentation in introduction of an exposure, but we often have the experiment as a preventive action occurred, as we had with the chimney sweep. We had a uh, change in process of let's clean the chimney from above, or let's use hygiene and uh, protective equipment and um, mortality from squirrel cancer did go down. So there was an experimental evidence of that uh, association. And an analogy, finally, that's, does it look like um, other disease that, uh, that we know of? Is there, is, there something, uh, is there something similar? So what do we do with that knowledge now? We can put that into a causation analysis for a specific worker or a group of workers and what I'm going to present is a NIOSH guide that uses six steps to make that determination. We'll go over the, the, the six steps. That's something that was initially published in uh, 1976. The, the current edition, 1979, is on the uh, uh, NIOSH website. Highly recommended if you have uh, any uh, involvement in, um, in causation analysis. Now, what's interesting is that guide was created mainly for prevention. So we need to know what's co what caused the disease so we can prevent it. Now, I experience when I see that guide used is pretty much compensation and litigation. And yes, that's also a reason the NIOSH created that guide. I can't say I have seen that guide used to, to prevent uh, disease, that diseases in um, in workers, uh, unfortunately. So let's go over the six steps so you have, a, you have a flavor of how to do it. The first step is confirming that there is a disease. And that seems obvious. Most of my work in uh, causation analysis in cancer, and it is not unusual that there is actually a question on that diagnosis where you think, you know, cancer, you have pathology, you have a pathology report, that should give you a very clear answer. But if you do that type of work, you know, make, make sure you're yourself, you as the uh, uh, person writing the report or doing the analysis, make sure that you, you are convinced that uh, the disease has been proven and the diagnostic criteria are present. Then you need to do the analysis of the epidemiology. And that's where, uh, that was not recommended by NIOSH, but probably a good practice is use the uh, health criteria um, to analyze, you know, not necessarily apply strict criteria, but analyze the, uh, the um, epidemiology literature, but see what, uh, what's bolded here in the NIOSH document. You cannot be one-sided. And very often when I see reports on causation analysis, I see uh, the, um, the author of the report saying, here are the five studies supporting my, um, my opinion. They don't tell you about the 10, 10 studies 
that um, contradict the opinion. Um, so as Nayar stated, you need to be comprehensive. You cannot be uh, one-sided. Now, sometimes you cannot be totally comprehensive because there are just too many studies and you need to have, uh, you need to have inclusion criteria. Um, then you need to look at the exposure. Here you see what, uh, uh, what NIOSH has. You rarely have evidence of exposure, exposure studies done for a specific worker. So you have a worker with cancer, you rarely have an exact quantification of what they have. Uh, you can certainly assume that they're, they're all, all firefighters are exposed to, to fires and products of combustion. Um, sorry. The, um, the, the, the recommendation for the evidence of exposure from the American College of uh, Occupational and Environmental Medicine has as the best evidence that quantify measurement at the level of a person. So let's say you do, you do air quality study at, um, at the work site, very, very happens. Uh, then you could have the data from another worker doing something similar or all the workers in, uh, in a specific environment, or you go with a job category or you even go with a job trade or even a, a work location. But you know, even that step three is pretty, uh, it's, it's sometimes pretty difficult to, to quantify. Then the, uh, the step four, um, I have two different parts is what else could be causing that disease? So what else could be causing uh, my, my, my firefighter's cancer? You have aggravation, which as you see, the Nair said, this is poorly understood here. The example they give you is a slaughterhouse and employees have arthritis, understanding that they're also older, um, yet the courts generally rule that that arthritis is job related, despite the fact that we don't know um, what is causing arthritis. The, the lesson here is this is, a, this is a legal or administrative decision. This is not a medical or a scientific decision but the uh, what we call the trial facts or the, the judge, the jurisdiction, they have to rely on medical testimony. And um, we have a role, uh, at least in occupational medicine, in answering the questions um, from the trial fact or from one of the parties to the litigation to help um, you know, reach a, a decision. Another piece in what could be causing the, uh, the condition is non, completely non-occupational factors, so not aggravation, but uh, unrelated factors. Give you an example of carpal tunnel. Um, no doubt there are some uh, occupational factors uh, behind carpal tunnel syndrome, but um, heredity, diabetes, obesity, and smoking are also risk factors for carpal tunnel. So what happens if you have somebody operating the jackhammer but has several of these non-occupational factors? Um, again, legal issue, but the legal system needs to rely on, um, on medical people, maybe on epidemiologists to help with the the determination of the compensation. Finally, the, before the conclusion, the, the step number five that NIOSH had, they call that validity of the testimony because they expected a formal hearing uh, with witnesses and they specifically list witnesses as being physicians, industrial hygienists or epidemiologists. Uh, practically, I think it, in modern causation analysis, is, is there a problem with the medical records that were submitted? Are there missing records? Are, are, the, um, are the, the records uh, contradicting um, each other? That's typically not a, a major issue. Uh, and then you have the conclusion and you see that number six, are there special circumstances? And the example that uh, Nayosh gives is, what if the PPE was faulty? Um, so that's where you need, uh, you know, ideally an, an, an experienced, uh, um, let's say, a healthcare professional, maybe an occupational medicine physician, uh, who can look at the, 
the totality of the uh, of the evidence, and then and then reach hopefully a, um, a, a neutral conclusion. Now, here is an example of uh, an occupation and a cancer. So that's going to be my question for the group. And I listed pretty much every study I could find. And I'll, I'll tell you the, uh, the cancer and the occupation once, uh, um, once we answer. But you see, they're relatively small studies. I mean, each study doesn't have a lot of uh, cases of that cancer. And then you see the, the relative risk or the um, summary uh, uh, standardized incidence ratio for each study with a 95th percent confidence interval. So let me ask you, let me ask the group, do you think the um, causal association is, is likely? Do you think we, you don't know enough? Or do you think there is no evidence of association? So are you convinced there is a causation? Um, do you think we don't know enough? Okay, likely evidence of association, no evidence of association. I think we oh, don't know enough. Please repeat question. <laughs> uh, Bagger, that's just the first study. Um, I think that's the, st the studies are just listed in alphabetic order. So do you think, you know, reading that table, um, do you think there is, you know, likely causation? Do you think there is enough evidence for you to say, yeah, I think, I think the, the job caused that cancer? Do you think you don't have enough information or do you think uh, there is no evidence? If there is enough to say there is no evidence of association. So likely, but not able to prove. Again, a couple of questions on what is the, what is the disease um, may not be statistically significant on evidence. Oh, please use the Q&A, not the chat. Unlikely causation, low number of workers. Yes, yes. Okay, so let me give you the, uh, let me give you the official answer. Thank you for, um, you know, working with me in that, uh, in that chat. So uh, there, there is a branch of WHO, the well. World Health Organization called IARC, the International Agency for Research on Cancer. And IARC, uh, so fairly recently, that's a publication from last year in The Lancet, uh, they, they reviewed, which they do periodically, uh, the uh, studies in um, cancer in firefighters. So the, the occupation here is firefighters. The cancer is mesothelioma, by the way, here. And that is the cancer that is, so it's one of the two cancers, the other one being bladder, when IARC said that there was, I'm quoting, sufficient evidence to determine that um, there is causation or carcinogenicity in humans. So sufficient evidence is, is the wording they use and they have a definition of what it is. Again, bladder being the other one, but, um, Mesothelioma, interestingly, had the highest risk. Uh, they quantify the risk as um, 1.58, doing a meta-analysis of seven cohort studies that are included in that list. I, I listed here every study I could find. So just to tell you that even when IARC says we are on very solid ground, no, the, the studies are still pretty small. And, and if you ask me, I, I would say, yeah, I think that there's probably, there's probably a causal association here. Yes, the studies are not ideal, um, but you have a lot of studies and so at least some of the studies are pretty big and, and pretty good. I mean, they're not large in, in the number of mesothelioma, but uh, that's the best evidence we, we have and it's certainly leaning toward uh, um, um, causal um, association. I mean, you see the largest study, the, the Daniels, which is a, a, an IOSH study has, a, a, you know, reaches a statistical significance, but understand that's, that's what we deal with in occupational medicine. We don't deal with very good study. We're lucky that for firefighters, we have a lot of studies 
but that is not that is not the rule in um, in uh, causation analysis. Now, here I'm giving you a list of cancer sites with sufficient evidence according to IARC. So you see the mesothelioma and firefighters, but that's just the list from, uh, from, their, from their website. So unfortunately, we still have a, a lot of occupations that are, uh, that are likely to cause uh, uh, cancer. And I had promised to give you uh, risk data. So chimney sweeps, um, I guess a couple hundred years ago, risk times 200. Hopefully uh, we are not seeing these risk numbers now, um, but this, what you are seeing here is a study by Pukala, 2009. It's 45 years of cancer incidence 15 million people in five Nordic countries. And I mean, I was surprised to see some of these numbers and the SIR is a standardized incidence ratio. Um, and, and they give possible explanations and, and that is just the first step toward, uh, toward prevention. Yeah, if we do a meta-analysis and increase the power, it could reach enough power, yes. And that's exactly what uh, the IARC did when they put all the, they put what they thought were the best studies, the uh, cohort studies, and they came up with a, with a combined um, meta-risk of 1.58. I will tell you, if you do a causation analysis, using meta-analysis creates, uh, 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 creates additional risk and additional uncertainty. Uh, I would say it's part of the answer, but it is not all the answer. I think you still need to have uh, uh, good cohort studies. Um, you know, why salivary glands? Uh, um, I think it's radiation. I did read their um, explanation. I mean, the, the real answer is we don't know, but they had a, a proposed explanation, which I believe was uh, um, was was radiation. Okay, so we have. So unfortunately, we are running out of time. So I will go over fitness for duty uh, fairly quickly. Uh, let me just give you um, one example of the media or fairly recently, a school bus driver got into a crash. Uh, did not apply the brakes. Unfortunately, six people died at 12 crashes in the past five years. The problem is he had a seizure at work the week before. The employer didn't do anything. Uh, that driver did not survive the crash. That driver had epilepsy. And uh, un unfortunately that had not, not been reported. And that's a case that you um, probably all know about. That is a pilot with depression. Uh, he got better, but he was told that he had symptoms, he should not fly. Um, fast forward to 2015, um, he's getting worse. Then he's admitted, do you want him to fly? Uh, unfortunately, he was flying and he crashed into a, a mountain in, uh, in Southern France. Um, so let me ask you, um, the audience, and I think that's my last, last life question. Let's say, you have kids or you had kids going to school in a school bus. And I'm telling you that the, the bad news is a school bus driver has epilepsy. Well, that's the bad news. The good news is that epilepsy is controlled. Is that good enough for you? And what is the acceptable risk that you parent? You know, forget that you are trained uh, uh, medical or public health professional. What is the acceptable risk that you as a parent um, agree with? for that school bus driver with uh, epilepsy. So uh, from a physician, uh, two physicians actually no, and the next one, no, I don't think it should be acceptable. I would not accept due to relapse. Okay, so you get the idea. And typically when I ask uh, um, at least managers, I typically get that answer. 
Uh, I will tell you that is actually not a, a legally acceptable answer. Um, but that's the first piece of uh, uh, finding some, or at least writing a medical standard is the risk of sudden incapacitation. So different causes, certainly seizure is the big one. Um, typically in the US, the acceptable risk is 1% per year. So most jurisdictions that I define that risk, they go with 1%. In, um, in the Commonwealth, in Britain, Australia, New Zealand, they typically go with 2%. But understand this is a, an employer decision. This is a, a community decision. This is not a medical decision. And as the occupational physician writing the medical standard, I ask the employer, what risk do you think is acceptable? Uh, the, the second piece to write medical standard is the inability to perform the essential, essential job functions. So what's absolutely required to do the job. Obviously, if you are blind, you can't be driving a truck down the interstate. And then you have the cognitive inability. So let's say you, you, you have, let's say you practice medicine and you have dementia, that, that could be a, a, a problem. Um, I said, I'm sorry, I have to uh, skip a few slides. These are the factors that are considered for a fitness for duty evaluation in general. So the first one is the diagnosis, and I'm going to give you examples. So epilepsy would definitely be a problem by itself. Um, schizophrenia, so chronic psychosis is another one. Uh, comorbidities. When I look at a mental health condition, I I'm typically asking about sleep disorders and substance use disorders as a, as a common comorbidity. I want to make sure that I know whether it's there or not. Now, severity in epilepsy, that would be the seizure-free interval. And to reach the 1% added risk per year, um, that's 10 years. So somebody with epilepsy defined as having in general two seizures in their lifetime, I think at a more 24 hour, at least at more than 24 hour interval, you need to be seizure free for 10 years with or without medications. To reach the 2% that the Commonwealth is using, you need to be eight years without seizures. So pretty difficult to, uh, to reach that. Then I need to know the treatment. And by treatment, I mean medications mostly and think that you are dealing with an employee with back pain, but they are functional. So yes, you can bring them back to work, but now for their back pain, they're taking opioids. So the opioid, because it's a sedating medication, will cause a problem by itself. Then you have the MMI, the maximum medical improvement. If somebody is not at MMI, they are likely to get better in the short term. So you're not going to give them a, a, a per, you're not going to make a permanent uh, decision um, in, in general, because they're likely to get better in the short term. If they have reached MMI, then it could be the, uh, um, the time to, to, uh, to have permanent restrictions and possibly uh, a job reassignment, which may not be uh, a medical issue. And I want to point out one more thing is GINA, the, the law that uh, um, uh, was in an earlier slide, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, for a fitness for duty, at least in the US, we cannot consider family history because of, uh, of GINA, which is a, a relatively uh, uh, recent uh, law. I mean, in the past, I believe, 15 years. So your question, is there a timeline in addressing MMI? It's actually jurisdiction specific. Um, quite often, it's six months. You know, is it likely that the person will get better within within six months? But I would go if it's workers' count. There is a very specific. Uh, if there is an uh, American Medical Association guides, it, it's in the guide, and uh, um, I I can't give you a, a broader answer than that. Um, and once we we are done with the fitness for duty as occupational medicine provider, we recommend restrictions, which could be temporary or permanent based among many things of that uh, MMI. Uh, we could recommend accommodations as well. The job, so think ergonomic uh, job modifications as an example, but it is up to management, hopefully uh, with legal advice to then implement or accept our recommendations. We as uh, occupational medicine providers, we are not making employment 
uh, decisions or determination be uh, be very clear we give advice to management the advice might be a little bit stronger on the on the work restriction than the accommodation uh, there is a under ada there is a, a requirement for the interactive process but that is with with management not necessarily with um, uh, with a medical piece and my very very last uh, uh, two slide i promise is uh, let's talk about occupational history briefly because this is often missed um, i see that as a social determinant of health and there are actually two determinants here one is the actual job but the other one is the workplace so ask for everything they do volunteering and hobbies as far as i'm concerned they count as jobs uh, if it's a history, ask for military, but go beyond the job title. Um, you know, I, I, I recently had uh, um, somebody give me a job title that gave me absolutely no idea. Uh, you know, something like custodian. Uh, you really don't know what they, what they do. So try to get as much description as you can. Um, that's where I would personally give a lot of emphasis to what the, the worker has to tell me. Uh, and some of the questions I would ask very specifically is exposure. So ICOM gives us a, a quick list of fumes, chemical dust, heavy metals, radiation. Uh, I would add noise. Uh, two additional questions I would try to ask every single time is how much do you lift and how much do you have to lift? Shift work. In which it's not obvious that people work different shifts and work nights. And obviously, if they are issued personal protective equipment, that means there is some type of uh, hazardous exposure. So thanks. Um, I, am, I am done. I'm going to stop uh, sharing. And now we can go over the, um, over the questions. So I'm going to read from the Q&A. And I am going to skip the questions that were related to what I asked you. So first question, do you prescribe medicine for infectious disease exposure, such as uh, Neisseria meningitidis? So yes, this is within the scope of occupational medicine. And so as a practicing uh, emergency physician, I was on the receiving end of uh, uh, meningococcemia prophylaxis, courtesy of my um, employee health uh, service. Um, um, so, so then we had quite a few questions on COVID and uh, the hierarchy of control. And I'm looking at the evidence of association with mesothelioma. I just wanted to point out how, how difficult it is to make that uh, causation analysis, even in this example that's, that he described as, by uh, WHO as being with the best evidence of all firefighters and cancers. Um, still scrolling down. Can please use the Q&A and not the chat. Reset. So let me go from the most recent. Uh, what do you think about <laughs> the CIA workers in Cuba and the issues related to possible work-related attack? Um, so I cannot talk to you about my work. Uh, I can only talk to you about occupational medicine in general. Um, uh, I, I would tend to say we don't have enough information for a definitive answer, or at least I don't have, I don't have enough information. That's, uh, that's for sure. Um, I have not seen an approach based on these NIOSH criteria of causation analysis. Um, um, do occupational medicine physician obtain or obtain DEA? Are you talking about a drug enforcement administration, um, um, like a, a license to uh, to prescribe opioids? And what would the process look like after medical school? Okay, so do we get DEA? That depends. If you do work a clinical, let's say workers' comp, if you see patients and you treat patients, again, it's mostly workers' comp. The answer is yes. 
Um, I mean, it could be practice specific and uh, uh, it's possible that you could deal with an employer that say, we're not going to prescribe opioids. But in my own experience in, in several settings, yes, I, I had and I still have a, a DEA number. Uh, if you purely do administration or you do, uh, let's say, ratings or causation analysis, then there, there, there would be no reason for you to have a DEA number. What's the process look like medical school? There is an occupational medicine residency. Um, they graduate less than 40 residents every year. Um, I can't give you exact numbers, but the most, the, the majority of physicians in the US or practicing, let, let's just look at physicians first, but the majority of physicians practicing occupational medicine are not board certified in occupational medicine. And then you have a lot of non-physicians who practice occupational medicine and do it and do it very well without medical school or, or residency. But this is a training you can get. You can get it on the job, you can get it through residency and you can get courses. Um, there, there are plenty of ways to, uh, to, to, to get that done. And uh, I mean, I, I've seen a lot of uh, um, emergency physicians who, um, you know, they get tired of, uh, of the ER and then they, they move to occupational medicine. That's what happened to my mentor and that's what, uh, what happened to me. And it's, uh, it's a fairly easy transition. But you've seen all the uh, competencies. You, you get to choose what you do. You, know, you don't necessarily have to to offer all services depending on the on the on the job you have and um, and your employer. And I think I see I think I see one question through the chat. How do you think occupational medicine and public health can reach out to each other and collaborate more? So actually, thanks for asking because I actually prepared that. Um, I mean, I mentioned the uh, example of the, of the worksite outbreak, especially if the worksite covers multiple workers, but uh, for public health, see occupational medicine as a resource. I will tell you by far, occupational medicine already sees public health as a resource. Um, meaning talking to health departments is a, is a fairly uh, uh, common occurrence, but see, I would say build bridges before the crisis. Uh, see occupational medicine as a, as a multiplier, and if you would need to reach out to a workplace, um, you know, probably your first question is, do you have in-house or contracted uh, occupational medicine? Because that's the people you want to talk to. And um, by far, I think they'll be um, they'll be uh, eager to talk to you. So. You know, see, see us as a, as a resource. Okay, what certificates would I need to do if um, no residency? The, the largest occupational medicine organization is ACOM, the American College of Occupational and Environmental Medicine. They offer, um, uh, they offer actually an entire curriculum in occupational medicine. And I, I th part of it is online. I think they are moving to have everything online. Um, so you can take it on your, at your own pace. I, I mentioned the FMCSA exams. That's an online training. There is an exam. I mentioned the impairment rating. You can take in-person or online training. Pretty much every, every aspect of occupational medicine you can find or a nonprofit or, or a vendor that, that's going to train you there. Uh, and, and I would go back to uh, get trained on the job. I mean, if you do, if you do primary care or let's say, um, general surgery or emergency medicine, you're already halfway there. Uh, it would be helpful to build standard da data into the national notifiable disease surveillance systems on industry and occupation. Yes, absolutely. 
and there is legislation that um, passed Congress a few years ago that uh, gave more work to the CDC. So thank you, CDC, for doing that. Um, for firefighters, um, NIOSH is now administering, um, I would say, an ongoing database on, on cancer. Uh, unfortunately, you do have the, the reporting issue because not everything is necessarily reported. So it doesn't, the, that database does not replace uh, um, uh, cohort studies uh, for causation. But yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, it would be nice to have uh, standardized uh, um, uh, disease surveillance system. And to a certain extent, we, we already have that. We'll give a few minutes in case there are any additional questions. So seeing no more questions, um, I think that will bring us to the end of the session. I wanted to talk thank uh, Dr. Zarnecki very much for an excellent presentation. I also wanted to thank the PMRF uh, program staff at CDC, Lillian, Gabriel, and Laverne, who work behind the scenes on these sessions. Um, and one last note is please be aware that the next grand rounds will be presented on the 3rd of May, uh, 2023. Um, so I think with that, we will end the session. We thank you very much for your attendance.